All right, I think we're ready to go. Hello, everybody. My name is Joe. Welcome to our in session talk. Uh, we have over 300 guests from 37 countries joining us today. Uh, the subject is Is design really humanity's best friend? Before I introduce you to our esteemed speakers, Jeremy and Tim, I'd like to cover a few housekeeping items. First, is that today's webinar is being recorded. We will share the recording on our event page at some point next week. Please use the chat button if you have any technical difficulties regarding the webinar. We also invite you to ask questions by using the Q&A button. You can upvote the questions that you like. Um, and um, without further ado, please join me in welcoming Jeremy and Tim. I'm going to hand you over to Jeremy, who is going to start today's conversation. Thank you. Thank you, Joe. Uh, hello, everybody. Um, I'm Jeremy Myerson. Um, I'm the Helen Hamlin Chair at the Royal College of Art. And uh, it's my great pleasure uh, to welcome all of you uh, to this uh, in-session uh, conversation with Tim Marlowe today. Um, we have been running these sessions so that we can stay in touch with our global community of entrepreneurs, innovators, designers, creators, um, while the RCA campuses are closed and while we can know we're not able to run the um, executive education masterclasses and courses uh, that so many people go on. Um, this is a way we can stay in touch and we're interviewing uh, some of the key figures uh, of the day in art and design. And it's my great pleasure to welcome um, Tim Marlowe, the newly appointed director and chief executive of the Design Museum in London. What a time to become director. No, no sooner have you sat down in the hot seat when it has to close. Um, a little bit about Tim, you probably know all about him, but uh, he's a former artistic director of the Royal Academy of Arts and director of exhibitions at White Cube. He's lectured on art and culture in over 40 countries and written and presented around 100 documentaries for radio and television, some of which I've actually seen and enjoyed. So, Tim, welcome. Um, uh, I think the first question we need to ask you is, how has lockdown been for you? Because no sooner than were you in post than the doors dramatically shut. It's a terrible indictment of me and my judgment that that happened. Um, and, and I'm, I'm quite a, um, I was going to say quite a physical person, but I believe in museums as, as centers of sort of physical energy and activity and, and communal spaces. So being, being banned, as it were, or having a self imposed ban from the, from the space and the institution I joined was, was really difficult actually to begin with. Uh, although the technology that you and I are now using that has been designed by uh, many great people has facilitated that a bit and has given a certain amount of headspace, but I really miss the physical space. I started going down to the building as soon as I could, just weekly, and if I'd been there today, and uh, I find that energised me or fired me up. Um, but um, I, I wouldn't recommend it for anyone who's thinking on taking a new institution. Don't go into lockdown if you can avoid it to begin with anyway. In any... Uh risk scenarios or um, uh, scenario planning. Did you ever think, uh, I mean, you're an experienced uh, uh, museum director. Did you ever think you would have a scenario in which you actually physically had to shut the doors for months on end? No, and you know, those risk assessment meetings that we've all sat in on, and I've sat in on many of them, I mean, they tend to encourage disaster movie thinking you know most of the, the ideas that are thrown around the edges of what could happen in risk tend to be the uh, the basis of the plot for an improbable hollywood film but no one but no one in any of the institutions i've ever been involved in saw a pandemic being, uh, closing down um, an institution for so long funnily enough you um you in a different kind of way you know you're talking about good lockdowns and, and bad lockdowns and predicting i know a lot of people from the creative communities artists, architects, designers, who are trying not to be too glib publicly, but who've wanted to slow down their activities, you know, their incessant traveling, their incessant meetings, their incessant physical uh, traveling, and wanted to be able to recalibrate their thinking. And I th think they've really enjoyed that. And I can see that, actually, I mean, the idea of having headspace to think. I mean, that, you know, we're going to come on to in the future what the future might hold as far as design is concerned. And there are massive problems economic social political but certainly people over the last four or five months 
uh, those creative people um, who are successful enough and being able to create interesting headspace, I think, to, to conceive of interesting things. There will be some very, very interesting ideas that come out of this. Yeah, I mean, what about your own headspace? I mean, what about uh, um, how was lockdown for you? Did you use it for thinking time about what you might do with the museum? In a new, in a new. I'd area. like to say, I'd like to say I did, <laughs> and and when I could, I did. But you know, one of the things that that we were really uh, up against, and I think is less so now, but was the uncertainty. So trying to plan for the future when you've no idea when the future starts again with the museum being open and trying to plan exhibitions and projects for the future and actually trying to figure out what you'd already planned, where that could fit in and how that could be. And the inevitable cancellation of certain things because your external partners no longer felt able to do it. Uh, it was the, that un managing uncertainty day to day was really problematic in, in that regard. Um, it's got slightly better now. We know we have a, we have a we, we have a, a clearer path. We know there are certain risks involved, but you know we've started to think about projects that we might do in two or three years' time, which is essential. Um, and and the financial aspect, lockdown had an immediate financial impact on a museum, uh, all museums, but particularly one that has a tiny amount of state funding. I mean, less than 2% of our funding comes from the Arts Council. And I have to say, the Arts Council have been incredibly uh, generous and I would say visionary. In uh, the, They gave us a recent substantial grant to get us through to the end of September. And the, managing that financial situation, which is still the case. I mean, I find it extraordinary that, that, you know, the only national design museum is not seen as part of a national portfolio. And there are all sorts of reasons for that. Um, but But that's something I'd like to look at in the future but that did make things difficult and and I, I was speaking to colleagues in institutions who were you know, better supported financially and although they had all sorts of traumas and problems you could see that it wasn't an existential one whereas I also sit sit on the board I've just stepped down from of Sadler's Wells and although that is well state supported and it should be you know the performative arts the theatres and and colleagues in that area are still really looking at a kind of void if they don't know when they're okay. going to reopen. Yeah. I mean, I mean, on a positive note, this the timing of this webinar could not have been better because the Design Museum is opening next week. So what's the opening going to look like? What's happening and what's going to be different about the museum experience? I'd just like to say that that glint in your eye and that that's that sense of a man's generosity of spirit as your face lit up talking about the good news i ought to share with everyone he's totally predicated on the fact that your football team won the uh, won the premier league and was given it for the first time in 30 I years i not mention that at all yeah. all the five goals we put past you last night yeah not on the agenda <laughs> thing and i would also say that live sport and the return of live sport eased my mental um issues at lockdown hugely even though there were kind of tensions because of the distraction and displacement of that i anyway, know that's another another matter you know it's a brilliant time for, to, for us to be talking because next, it's a week on friday we have the public we have uh our press days next week and the museum it was really interesting because we had this exhibition, Electronic, uh, which is from uh, Crawford to the Chemical Brothers, which is an exploration of the origins of electronic music, really a kind of survey of, of, of electronic music over the last 30, 40 years and its relationship to art, fashion and contemporary design. It's, it, and it was ready to open. It was two weeks off opening. So it, it all had to be stored and, I mean, mothballed in the museum stores, climate controlled and so on. But it's meant that um, with negotiations with our partner, La Philharmonie in Paris, who we did the exhibition with, it came from there. That was that was touch and go at one point as to whether or not it, we could still do it for the length of time we wanted to. But they've been great partners. And suddenly we now have the opportunity to stage a brand new exhibition that no one's seen which is which is great and there's a lot of interest in that um and which feels like kind of core mission for a, for a museum like the design museum because it, it, we're, we're essentially about exhibitions and projects well and, most designers are craft work fans aren't they so um yeah they are <laughs> and, and uh then the contemporary see like the chemical brothers and others have worked with some brilliant designers i mean smith and lyle and others so there's a nice symbiosis there but yeah no craft but you couldn't um no, that there'll be. Um, I mean, I, I think the, uh, I think the demographic and the uh, range will be quite broad for this show. As in, I mean, our audience are pretty broad at the design museum, but there'll be a lot of, uh, I would say, men of a certain age dressed in a certain way who'll be coming to that exhibition too. The craft, and you can spot that tribe some 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 distance away. So obviously, you're going to have to put in hygiene and social distancing measures, but but on a on on a kind of more fundamental scale. What's your big takeout from the disruption, from the pandemic? What are you bringing now back to the live museum? 
that you weren't thinking about before? Well, I, I want to get over. Um, I mean, I, I don't want us to be um, uh, risk obsessed. I think we need to still have that confidence. Mm. And and I want uh, one of the things I'm bringing back is which I did know before, but it's the preciousness of it now which is this sense of museums of spaces of shared experience. I mean, I've always felt that. I mean, you know, the digital revolution and the ongoing digital um, and technological uh, developments are fascinating things. They're important things. They're aspects of cultural life that need to be showcased in a design museum. And, and, and but, but they're also another reality that drives people to the shared reality of the, of the spaces that we, that we have in the museum. So it's that kind of preciousness really. And, but I think also of, um, of just wanting to make sure that we uh, that we're even more agile and sensitive to the world around us, because a, a design museum needs to look at what's happening in the future. I mean, showcase the present, look at the future, and, and occasionally recontextualise from the past. And that means that we need to be able to to act quickly, which I think we're in a position to do. But you know, something like this shows how vulnerable uh, society is, humanity is, but how technology becomes one of the I mean, one of the central ways in which we, we mediate that. And we ought to be in a position. Uh, leadership is something that I think is overstated by cultural institutions, but certainly we can take a lead in showcasing and, and exploring that which may help us get through this in the future. Yeah. Just just for our, our participants, um, if you'd like to ask a question, put it on the Q&A. If you'd like to make a comment, uh, put it on the Q&A. Uh, I'll be monitoring that stream and I'll be threading them into our conversation. So we're not going to wait for the end um, for a few um, audience uh, Q&A. We're going to try and kind of blend it into this conversation. Um, so so uh, do that. Um, uh, we'd love to hear from you. Um, so, um, Tim, if we, if we narrow it down a bit and talk about design and what designers can do in relation to a post-COVID world, what are the themes that you and your curators are knocking around now? What are the what what's bubbling up to the surface around the future role of designers in relation to COVID? I mean, a lot of designers have stepped up to the plate during the pandemic and done all kinds of stuff from public awareness campaigns to face masks to hospital ward layouts and so on. Um, yeah. Well, it's funny. I mean, we've we've had it. We put out a, a call um, uh, for for hand for rethinking hand sanitizer dispensers and the way we do that, and we're showcasing that. So, in a kind of small way, that's that will be that will be there. Some of the winning entries will be showcased in the designs in when we open next week. Um, but I mean, I, I think I think uh, in the public services and public policy and the whole notion of, of health and, and people's safety we should be looking at and, and trying to sort of push on and showcase. But I think the idea of a sustainable world, a future, a future world that's sustainable um, becomes more and more acute, actually, because of the economic as well as the social and, and medical um, fallout from COVID. And uh, there's an exhibition that we're, that, that was in the pipeline that I've sort of um, fast tracked and we're going to do something, a, a big show next year. I have to be careful. My press office are brilliant, but they like, they like to make sure things are choreographed. No, they give too much away. But let's just say the circular economy net zero and waste wouldn't be a million miles away from that and i think that's a critical area for us to be to be looking at yeah i mean i can understand that because from my perspective in the helen hamlin center for design we've spent years talking about circular economy we've talked about sustainable living and actually in a pandemic that goes into reverse because people are not reusing things they're they're using things once they're using things once and throwing it away because of fears of the plague and yeah. you know, packaging's not being reused and there's a lot of waste in, in, a, in a pandemic situation. So I, I think it's a very, very good one to actually um, uh, look at. I mean, one area in which the Helen Hamlin Centre at the RCA is very interested in is the issue of design for ageing. And we have a new project in which the Design Museum is a, is a is a strategic partner and there's going to be a lot of a, a lot of showcasing and events at the at the museum um it's called the design age institute uh, it opened in may right in the middle of the pandemic and what better time to do that because i think what's happened with coronavirus is shown the vulnerability of our care system what's happening in our care homes and isolating older people pushes back the frontier of healthy aging which is all about interaction and mobility and being in the workforce and so on and so forth have you got plans for the design museum 
I know you're very now heavily implicated in ageing. Are you going to be looking at other social challenges and how are you going to do that? No, we, we are. I mean, there's an initiative, and again, you're, you're well aware of it, it's good to share, called Future Observatory, that we're hoping um, within the next five to six months is something that gets approved, that gets serious state backing, and that puts the Design Museum as the, as the hub in a national network of research uh, spokes, research centres, that will look at AI and data, the future of mobility, public services, place or placemaking and, and net zero and funnily enough aging actually informs so much of that i mean it was going to be separated but actually the future of mobility has implications for an aging population public services uh, uh, health policy and, and i think that's always been your position hasn't it that it we shouldn't separate aging and, and often that when design for an aging population is taken on board it's usually some horrible um, handle for a shower unit or whatever rather than just being naturally part of good design thinking which also extends to social policy um, you know, the notion of how cities are designed where mm -hmm. it's made accessible to all and obviously an aging population is a critically part of that so I, I mean I'm, I, I'm really um excited by that the challenge of that and getting future observatory off the ground but it also shows the range that's needed and i think having that range of expertise of design research in these different centers um i mean there are research fellows design research fellows thinking about this um that i love that idea of expertise but also big picture uh, collation and and the role of an institution in being able to disseminate and facilitate the exchange of those ideas and actually you know be cross-disciplinary cross-sector which is what the design museum should be yeah i mean i think in a way you've answered uh, one of the questions that's just popped up on my feed this is from tom fleming will you be exploring exchange between the design museum and the rca as a former member of Design Museum and RCA alumni, I was surprised to discover so little happening. Well, actually, there's a lot happening with the Design Age Institute, Future Observatory and so on. Yeah, but, but it's a very good point, Tom. And I, one of the things I, I said from the beginning of my uh, already brief tenure, um, but, um, it, but it feels quite a long time having been locked down for some of it, is that we need to be uh, more open and collaborative it's not the design museum hasn't been that in the past but it seems clear that that's what we need to be so with uh, i was particularly with academic research and academic institutions i mean the rca and the design museum and natural partners bedfellows um but i think we also need to get closer to industry to the design communities i mean one of the things i enjoyed in my previous work uh, both at the royal academy which was artist and architect led um and then in the commercial art world when i was at white cube was working closely with creative people. And I think that that's what the Design Museum should do even more of. And that also includes entrepreneurs and the overlap with business and actually putting those creative ideas into, into production, mm. uh, into cultural production or physical production. So yeah, uh, much more collaborative and open if we can be. So um, I'm going to go to our first poll. And so we can test the temperature in the room, or the virtual room, big virtual room. Um, so our first poll, um, uh, is about in building a post-COVID society, um, what's, what's designers uh, going to be a, uh, what are they going to do? Are they going to contribute across the board in a sustained way? So a big sustained impact, make a difference in one or two key cases, so little spots of light, or have a marginal effect around the edges. So please vote and um, uh I can see the scores coming in. The scores are changing uh, all the time. Um, just while we're just while people are scoring that, we've had a uh, request for more on the hand sanitizer project. Um, uh, this is from Darshan Gandhi. Um, can you throw some more light on the rethinking the hand sanitizer project? Um, yeah, I will. <laughs> this is terrible. Come to the museum, but also go on the website and you'll see there the, the was all sorts of, I mean, different categories. Uh, of, of, I mean, we, there are there um, children as well being invited, but professional design, uh, uh, thinking about about in public places, the ritual of it all, the cl the cleansing of things like mobile phones. Uh, there's a unit that goes in the middle of a table in a restaurant where you can put your mobile phone and get it cleansed rather than put this contaminated object on the table um in the way that water fountains are often found in public there's quite some, some very imaginative solutions to hand sanitizing uh, as a public ritual um, in in places and spaces um 
doorknobs and, and handles that secrete their own cleansing uh, agents and so on. So um, it's quite a rich it's, uh, it's quite a rich territory, and we're showcasing well one or two of the winning entries but we want to showcase much more but we, we there's documentation of, of the 10 categories at the, the museum so look on the website but come and visit um you obviously have to book your slot uh, to come and see the um uh, electronic exhibition but on the balcony on the mezzanine you can see the um the winning the winning submissions and i think that's something that's going to keep keep developing i mean it's an evolving competition if you like and we, we're expecting more and more people to, to wrestle with that issue great well, thank you, Tim. So the poll, we're pretty optimistic. We're an optimistic bunch. Um, this is the uh, results. Uh, um, designers will contribute across the board in a sustained way. Um, uh, two thirds of our group believe that's going to happen, which is very positive. Uh, only no, less than 10 percent uh, think it's only going to have a marginal effect around the edges. And it's a quarter of you who think there'll be one or two big impact case studies. But um, it won't happen in, in the kind of significance and sustained way. But that's that's pretty positive. What do you make of that, Tim? Um, um, well, of course, uh, you know, I, I want I want my cake and eat it really on that, because I, I think that design should be able to contribute across the board in a sustained way. And if the political will is there, uh, that will help us to, to some extent. I mean, there's already one point five billion being made available to um um, innovative firms and businesses but we also know from the research that we've seen an interesting paper from the enterprise research center the erc looking at the last recession and it, six plus years to recover for process and, and product service innovation in companies so um that you know that that's something that's that's being that's un, been understood from research and hopefully the money is available to, to, to facilitate research and development and innovation which will enable design to contribute more in a more sustained way across the board but i think it's also clear that there'll be certain areas where it can make a difference quickly in key cases i mean we know it's scientific exploration that will find the vaccine but it's design thinking that will that will distribute that and we'll find ways of um, of getting it to the largest numbers of people so i'm hoping it's a little bit of both um, I, I, I'm surprised that, that uh, from this group, even 9% think it will only have a marginal effect on the edge. I'd imagine that is a worry, that yeah. there just isn't a political will and that economically we're going to return to um, the bad habits of mass production and, and, and not look innovatively. We'll just sink back to how we were, but I'm, I'm hoping that isn't the case. So if we move on now, I mean, we've established that there's appetite for designers to play a key role in shaping the post-COVID world. What can the cultural institution do about it? How can you be a convener, a facilitator? And, you know, I, 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 it, it would be wrong of me to talk to a museum director without, without mentioning the current crisis of, of representation. And, you know, the liberal arts institutions, how can they maintain their leadership role? I think that is a, this is a big thing that everybody is struggling with. Yeah, I mean, I, I think that the liberal institutions and cultural institutions ought to lead by example in many ways. And therefore, we all have admitted, most of us have admitted, we could and should do a lot more in terms of our inclusiveness and the diversity of audiences and indeed the practitioners that we represent. Uh, I think when institutions start to claim that they're going to take a leadership role in that, I think they're delusional or hubristic. Uh, I think we can lobby and we can be, you know, we can facilitate. But I think that, you know, leadership comes from both from society and from um, our, our political and economic masters more. And we, we um, and liberal institutions, you know, can lobby, but I, I think leadership's difficult in that. But I think we can take a lead in showcasing and 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 lobbying. And I think that actually... I mean, design and architecture is very interesting, isn't it? Because the visual arts, which is the world that I came from, and, you know, there's kind of overlaps, in spite of the fact that in some ways it's it's more economically conservative. In other words, it, it's this free market that is seen to have a huge influence on the way that the contemporary art world is and operates. Um, but you don't need to be trained professionally to, to be an artist. Therefore, there are many people who've been able to practice uh, on what's called the outside in the outsider tradition, whose work now is being voraciously sought by the market. And actually, it, it makes the art world seem quite inclusive because a lot of those artists are people who, who, who are from from 
social, economic and um, ethnic backgrounds that, who haven't been seen as central to the Western canon in the past. And the market's jumped on that. The problem we have in design and architecture is because it requires this professional training for all sorts of reasons, but social and political reasons, we've, it's, it's not a particularly inclusive world. It, 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 the, the, the education has, has seemed to, to encourage people from a certain ba limited backgrounds only to train as, as designers and architects. And that has to change. That has to change through, through design education, but also from, you know, from the lobbying and, and um, you know, the direct impact that institutions like ours can have and yours indeed in, in that regard. So education learning is pretty central to that, I think. I mean, um, it's interesting you compare and contrast the art world, artists and designers. I remember a famous quote from Alan Fletcher, the great graphic designer who had, had his own retrospective at the Design Museum when it was at Shad Thames. And he said, artists solve their own problems, designers solve other people's, which I thought was quite a neat way of, of, of dealing with these things. And it is about some of the utopian aspects of design, uh, um, that, it, that, it, that it, it, is, it is holding out the hope for, you know, improvements in the world and therefore must reflect um, the world in all its diversity, I suppose. Yeah, in a way that in a way that art is 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 not necessarily, uh, you know, people are dealing with their own psyche. They are, but and and um, I mean, some artists obviously there's a whole body of art of, of art practice which is about. Yes, but, not, uh, but I think it's a reasonable position to take, and and I think that um, I mean, there is a art is somehow revered more because it's non-functional but at the same time there can be a dismissive idea that anyone you know anyone can be an artist you know that the the the, the, um, the joseph boyce idea that anyone can be an artist and in fact we all have those creative potentials certainly when we when we're young or, uh, many of or most of us do but what interests me about design is of course it needs professional standards and of course you need to show a certain level of accomplishment before someone's going to commission you to design a building but what's interesting is the potential that uh, the young have so we have this thing at the design museum it's been going for 10 years um called design ventura where uh, it's a really interesting thing of design and, and entrepreneurship where uh, uh school children 14 15 year olds are encouraged to work in groups and to um, come up with an idea for uh, not, uh, for something that can be designed and fa and put into production that will sell for under 10 pounds in the design museum shop and to date, I think I think we're up to about 80,000 state school children have taken part in that. There were over 15,000 active participants last year from various state schools. We socially engineer it in the sense that there are two competitions, one's for private and overseas schools because they have much greater resources and the other's for state schools. And the level of, you know, and there are groups that, I mean, they come to the Design Museum or we can do digital workshops where how you generate ideas, how you try and facilitate them. Uh, practitioners will talk about process but also entrepreneurs will talk about how you um, work out a business model and get something fabricated and, and make it viable. And the level of thinking and the engagement and enthusiasm really does make me think, not that anyone can be a designer, but many more people can be designers than are currently uh, encouraged to go into the profession. So um, we're going to move to our second poll now, because I think we've knocked around the idea of the role of designers and we've knocked around the idea of the cultural institution and what it can do. And you've given some really good examples. So I'm talking about museums and galleries generally in the post COVID COVID world. What will they do? Will they, will they be about initiating new ideas and catalyzing change, being agents of change, or are they going to reflect and interpret what's happening now? They don't see it as their role to lead, or are they going to focus on past achievements? They're going to take a, a traditional art historical perspective on, on subjects like design. Um, so let's give you a few moments to uh, um, let's give you a, a few moments to vote on that. And I'm going to um, come to a couple of a uh, uh, couple more questions. There's one from Eleanor Alcorn. She says, in the light of economic hardship across the creative community, R&D will surely be cut in corporate settings. Does the design museum see a role for itself? In, in linking up uh, talent with corporate patrons. Is that something you do or might do? I think we should think about doing more of that. Uh, we have to find resource, but I think that's part of, um, of the think of thinking behind the Future Observatory. It's one of the roles of, of an institution, of a cultural institution, to be able to um, 
uh, showcase facilitate uh, uh, R&D and uh, innovative thinking and, and actually to make that link. It's quite interesting that there are there, there are many ideas out there. Not all of them are, are linked up with the, the means to get them realised or, or produced. So, yeah, we, we should do that. It's an, it's an interesting thing because I'm just referring back to the Enterprise Research Centre, the ERC paper on innovation and so on um interesting wider innovation and r d which is marketing and strategy increased during the last recession but it's product and service and process innovation that doesn't and that's where we need to look at so we need to make sure we don't we don't just think about strategic thinking or, or market thinking in, in that regard it is about process and, and and product and service i think so let's have the results of the poll and it's really really interesting because um the camp uh the virtual room is pretty much split between 51 percent saying initiate new ideas and catalyze change really be out there on the front line of change and 46 percent uh are saying reflect and interpret what's happening now be more of an, an interpreter and a facilitator and um only three percent say take the old route focus on the past uh, museums are about the past um, what do you make of that, Tim? Are you surprised that there's it's pretty much an even split there? Um, yeah, I think it's not a bad balance, actually. Um, uh, I suppose it's the way the question's worded. Focus on the past, uh, past achievement exemplars, sure, put like that. Uh, revisit the past and learn from it and reconfigure it. And may have had a more positive response. I think there's certainly a role for museums in that, um, you know, with, without giving too much away. Um, um, Charlotte Perrion is a figure who's not well known in this country ought to be much better known to a much broader audience uh, that may be uh, something to be, to be a major show at the Design Museum where it may get people to rethink about the entire gender balance of modernism and, and the way it's been in the past with a view to how it might be in the present and the future but anyway um, but I think that it's a good and healthy balance for museums because I don't think they should solely be um, reflecting and interpreting what's happening now but that is clearly a major role for museums but at the same time to initiate new ideas and catalyse change that ought to be a priority too I'm afraid it's a cake and eat it I'd go for both of those um, I think well we're in, a, we're in a British first past the post yeah sure system. well it's 51% percent for change. Change. <laughs> <laughs> yes well, I'm not for remaining in the status quo of this, uh, nor am I from, uh, for a complete fragmentation uh, of, from what we did in the past. But yeah, I think I think the emphasis on new ideas and, and, and a catalyst for change has to be uh, central for a design museum. We, that has to be a major priority of ours. OK, so, um, well, thanks, everybody, for voting. We've got one more poll to come during the webinar. But I want to I want to steer you on to another subject, which is one could broadly describe as the post-digital museum. And there's a lot of talk about the heritage sector, the museum sector, and reaching digital maturity. And I, and by that, I don't just mean um, digital media interface with audiences and exhibits and gallery design and so on, but using, using um, digital technology throughout the entire back of house operations, being a digital organization, um, because what's happened in the pandemic is that it's really accelerated that for a lot of corporate organizations. Are cultural organizations going to be digital in, in quite the same way? Are you going to allow curators to work from home? Are you going to talk to your audiences in new ways um, through digital channels? Yeah, I think we, we have to. And I think that the idea that um, particularly curatorial teams and content generators i think it's 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 essential that they're given that kind of flexibility i mean i think a lot of the staff in a museum short to medium term will be working very flexibly but i think it's something that we should be in uh, uh, generating and, and making possible uh, much further into the future i would still go back to my uh assertion at the beginning that museums are communal spaces and they're shared communal spaces and that includes staff uh, but not all the time. And I think that flexible way of working is, is inevitable or should be embraced. Um, I don't have any problems with it. There's no and the suspicion that you, if you're at home, you're not working. I, I, I'm certainly, I'd be more productive at home because I, I don't have that travel issue. Um, 
Oh, then again, I don't have that headspace of sitting on a tube reading a paper or getting lost in my thoughts. Anyway, that's an, that's another issue. I think back of house is very interesting, actually, Jeremy. Yeah, because I, I do think, uh, provided we can find the finances, I think that the museum sector, in some ways, that the way that we communicate with our audience, the, the initiatives that we can uh, generate, our desire to become national or more national and international, we have to be able to reach those audiences through digital technology. Um, and I think the, you know, the the the, the old model of I mean, museum people travelled incessantly, and that has to change. That's neither sustainable uh, nor desirable in a in virtual a, conferences. Yeah, exactly. And and th- through learning, I mean, and, and you know, conversations like this, we can we can have uh, plenty of them, and uh, I think that's to be welcomed. Um, it's interesting though as well that the the. the um, before lockdown, you think about kind of digitalized, thinking more about artificial intelligence, uh, which is an, an extension of, of, of that world in a way. Um, one of the one of the one of the most freakish things that happened to me that I'm still um, mildly traumatized by, but also fascinated by, was I did an interview with a robot who identifies as both female and an artist called Ada. Um, uh, the robot is created by Aidan Meller from the Engineered Arts with Oxford PhD students. And this was at the Saraband Foundation, Alexander McQueen's foundation in, in Islington. And, um, and, and this robot produces works of art. And it, the algorithmic, uh, algorithmical programming of her uh, is really fascinating. So you have this conversation with it her uh, anyway we're going to repeat that we're looking at doing a project uh, in that regard um and i think that will in some ways uh, generate a massive interest it'll throw throw into some sharper relief the um the darker side of, of ai and it will it will it will make some of the staff at the design museum very excited by the future and, and others actually determined to make sure that they come into the museum so something doesn't take their so a robot doesn't take their role <laughs> I mean, I think once you open the digital box and, and, and you go down the route of becoming a digit, digitally mature organisation, you then introduce a lot of other um, design disciplines, design thinking, service design and so on. I've got a question here from Lucio Rourke from the Helen Hamlin Trust. Um, design is often subconsciously linked to products and things, but it runs through everything, including leadership service delivery to address societal problems. Does the design museum have a role in the space as well as the designed object space? So I think behind the question uh, from Lucy is, is, is this idea that we see the design museum put things on plinths for at least the first decade of its existence. How do you show these other design disciplines? How do you show service design, for example? Um, uh, well, it's a good question, but we, we've got this uh, extraordinary building uh, which is full of, I mean, generously space, spatial. There are all sorts of discrete spaces that many of you will never have seen, and some of you will have done. There's this vast space, the central atrium, um, that is just begging to, for me animate it, to animate it more. There are all sorts of ways of showcasing events, people's thinking. Uh, uh, you, you, I mean, th- there's a kind of atrium, but th- there's an auditorium possible in that main space. There's a, there's, a, there's an auditorium downstairs, uh, and and I think it's all about you know, the, it, we should be a, a hub, a place where ideas are exchanged, which are not object based on plinths. The problem is, the business model of our museum, like other museums, is predicated on the idea of exhibiting things. And that includes installation, which are and experiences that, that the public want to come and see. And that's good and healthy and communal. But we have to find a business model that will facilitate or enable us to be able to share the idea that design is leadership or structural thinking or societal thinking. But uh, we've already started to look at that. And I think that it's, it is a, there's a whole range of scale of activity and a whole range of different partnerships and activities that can take place in different spaces around the museum. I mean, you know, we've had designers in residence going for a long time at the Design Museum where actual thinking and, um, and, and the generation of ideas is there. You can see it, you know, behind glass. I mean, it's, I'm making it sound more goldfish bowl than it is. But I think it's a, it's a good point, um, and, and it's something that we need to, to engage with more. But we need to find a business model that enables that more. So we need to find ways of funding that kind of activity. I mean, actually, with the... Kubrick blockbuster that Dan Sujic curated uh, so brilliantly. Um, you know, we were talking about film production design, which is visual in one sense, but you saw the thought processes and the decision making uh, of the director, which is actually slightly oblique um, to, you know, a visual culture. 
Um, but it, that was done brilliantly by the museum. So I think there are some examples there. Well, it was, but also electronic music, although there's the physical technological invention of, of, of machinery and equipment, the exhibition is as much about uh, tribal groupings, the breaking down of certain barriers, the, 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 the DIY culture around club and rave, and rave culture, the idea about DJing and sort of people being able to produce that kind of music in their bedrooms or in their some small scale studios, you know, the, the illegal rave scene, the kind of graphic design that emerged from that, the symbiotic relationship to fashion and so on. So, yeah, I mean, there's another example of, of, of it's an immersive installation based Exhi uh, exhibition with certain objects of course but it's um like kubrick there are there are other things there too yeah so um i'm gonna um time is is rushing on and there's lots of lots of very very interesting questions i just want to um for those of you who are wondering how did we come up with this title uh, is design really humanity's best friend um tim chose it because uh, the design museum has a quite provocative um, tagline, which is design colon humanity's best friend. And I just wonder, Tim, um, uh, you know, obviously everything is under review now and, and I'm not talking about the tagline, but, but how will you make that case of design in relation to humanity and, and what might be the big themes that you catalyze? And we've talked about some of them. Um, but are there, are there any kind of, big flags you'd like to wave at this point um, oh, i'd like future observatory to, to get off the ground because i think it's so central to the way that the museum can build its content its vision its sense of what it, it should become how it will evolve in the next five years and um, because it can I, I think if we root our uh, activities around research and the closeness to the research institutes and to the design community or communities then our role as popularizer expanding audiences bringing new audiences to design showcasing uh, extraordinary thinking being able to be cross-disciplinary cross-sectional i think really plays out i'm certainly not though throwing baby out with bathwater on the um the strap line i mean design clearly is humanity's best friend it's clearly also bad design is a problem and could be humanity's worst enemy or contribute to that um but it's it and equally i think the economic pressures of mass production and bad design or um ineffective design are going to be critical issues too that we you know it's difficult for the design museum to to, to claim it can influence that but i think by showcasing the best and the most imaginative design uh, research and, and activity, we have a chance of of, um, of ensuring that you know, better design gets out there. I mean, and, and but that's a huge responsibility for all of us. I mean, the way we the way we consume, everyone is now talking about the need to consume better and more responsibly, um, and yet everyone is facing this kind of economic problem of, uh, of how they're going to generate the revenue to get through that so we we um we we have major um major issues uh, ahead but I, I hope the design museum can um can be a place where uh, if all these different worlds can can collide or elide creatively um we we certainly need to be seen even more than we are now as a place where design community feels some kind of ownership wants to wants to get involved wants to be there wants to help wants to contribute and i've been doing a series called design dispatches which we began in in lockdown talking to illustrious designers um from across the spectrum of design you know how they were coping with lockdown now it's become much more about what they're doing and how they're thinking of the future and um i'm heartened by the number of people who are keen or happy to take part um no one has actually said no it's just a question of finding the right kind of um timing for that and i think that is heartening that you know that we're seen as a, a an institution that people want to you know take part in discussions take part in debates um so that is heartening but you know whether or not we can um find the right kind of economic model uh to do exactly what we want to do in the next five years i mean that's the that's the big issue right now i make no bones about it sorry you can never have a conversation with a museum director without yeah. talking about funding but we are <laughs> you know do you, do, you, do you want the stats? Well, I'm not giving you time to say no. Terence Conrad has contributed about 75 million to the Design Museum since it was founded in 1989. And um, 
in that time, state support, uh, for, I think because the feeling is that Terence is this generous benefactor that he is, uh, there's been political issues with other institutions about, you know, our role uh, in relationship to them. But uh, and we're now coming to the point where Conrad Foundation money, the coffers are pretty well emptied. I think we've had, we're going to get the last tranche to get us through the next six months to the end of the fin uh, this financial year. And after that, we have to find ways of raising more money than we've done in the past, but not that much more money. And when you think about a design museum that's been independent pretty well in terms of its funding, that's raised everything it needs to raise uh, privately, that's had no debt, that's got this new uh, building, the Commonwealth Institute converted by John Pawson, you'd have to think it's worth backing in the future. And you'd have to think in the cultural landscape that there has to be role uh, role for a singular you know, national design museum. Um, so that's the case I've got to make. So all the conversations that we have and everything that I want this institution to be and everything you want it to be and the people listening here, I hope, want it to be, is predicated on the on, on us being able to find the funding to do that. But um, it, I think there are serious um, uh, reasons why we will do. But um, it's still a, a certain leap of faith at the moment. Yeah. So um, we're just going to, uh, uh, Joe, if you could bring up our, our third poll and our final poll. So um, if you could bring out a baking bucket, that would be great. <laughs> <laughs> um, so, you know, I, I've just I've just thrown in some big ideas here just to get a, a sense of everybody's, uh, everybody, how people are feeling. How can design really be humanity's best friend? Uh, concentrate on reducing our environmental footprint, fostering greater social cohesion everybody seems to argue with everybody else at the moment and find reasons to hate and um, dispute um, and then resilience in the global pandemic um, uh, so let's see how people um, while people are voting I'm going to go to our very rich uh, live stream of questions um, and there's one here from Victoria um, Walsh um, with so much discussion of the post-global, how will the Design Museum navigate or locate itself nationally and internationally? It's a very interesting very question. Interesting question from Victoria. Thank yeah, you. Yeah, it is. Um, nice to hear from you, Victoria, too. Um, funnily enough, one of the things, you know, the Design Museum won European Museum of the Year in 2018. Uh, so its international position is quite interesting and i suppose secure and there's all sorts of international partnerships but we need to develop those as well but interestingly uh, i want to become more national and the, na the net the national network of of research um uh, i mean mini hubs but research centers and us becoming a hub for that i think will play well to that but actually from the beginning i went to see local groups spent time with the local council and i think the notion of local and hyper local is really interesting in a post-COVID world. I mean, Ken, uh, the Royal Borough of Kensington and Chelsea, on one level, you think it's incredibly rich and which should be able to support all manner of cultural activity. But it is uh, a borough where there's serious poverty and, and, and non-inclusiveness. And actually reaching out to that, that, that which is around us and actually trying to become more local is something that we've already started to look at and do. And I think with learning and education, certainly in the... In, in the in the immediate aftermath of the post-COVID world, is something that we and other museums are going to have to seriously focus on because you know, there won't be the scope, the resources, or the ease for for um, large groups of um, of school children or, or um, university uh, students to, to to visit in the way they did before. We hope in the end they will be able to do that, but we need to get out there an outreach program, but also, as I say, to become quite hyper local. So it's it's an interesting opportunity, I think. Yeah, thanks for that. Um, the results of the poll, um, very interesting. Nearly a third uh, want to foster greater social cohesion. I think in the pandemic where people have been isolated and also, you know, the great wars on social media, I think we feel a great need to kind of reach out. And that's a tough ask for a design museum, though. How do you develop the projects and the programming to support that? Um, uh, nearly 30 percent reducing the environmental footprint. Less focus on, on the resilience in the pandemic. But of course, as you know, and as I know, as an academic researcher, it's all how you ask the questions. Uh, Indeed. Any comments on that? Social well, cohesion. the way to foster greater social cohesion starts with uh, book your slots and come and see electronic. You can share it with 60 people an hour, 15 people every uh, 15 minutes. 
and uh, at social distance, you can sit in Holland Park or um, uh, ha- have a coffee in the, the, the increasing number of cafes and bars that are opening up around us. No, look, I, I think um, I think museums as places of, of, of coming together are, are, are obviously important, but the, there's a certain kind of audience, and we certainly need to be an institution that opens ourselves up to, to broader audiences. I would say we've got a very interesting platform on which to build there, though, Jeremy, because the um, I think 28% of our visitors are... Um, are uh, from uh, BAME background, which is uh, much higher than many other institutions. That shouldn't make us complacent, but that's interesting and it's something to build on. Or, uh, and therefore, we, we can try and be more inclusive and more diverse. And also, our, uh, that we have a very high percentage of visitors under 35, which, um, and I'm uh, uh, speaking to the Helen Hammond uh, um, uh, professor as you are, I'm all for attracting aging audiences. The Royal Academy's demographic was, um, was let's say, mature. But it is interesting that we have a very young audience at the Design Museum, which I think all goes well. Yeah. Okay. Um, the, the most liked question in our stream is from Fernando uh, uh, Galden. Um, what, what is the museum's strategy to build research in the moment and become a generative space for knowledge rather than a showcase. I like this term, research in the moment. Uh, yeah. The live um, events, workshops, yeah. science sprints. Yeah. Uh, so much of our effort and energy at the moment uh, is focused on working with the AHRC to get Future Observatory off the ground. This has been a year at least of of thought and, and it's been an intensive three to four months of research but with the research fellows and, and we've all been in meetings um, in the last few weeks to get this uh, into shape so these submission can go in uh, we're not putting all our eggs in that that basket but i think we as i said before we, we want to build a huge amount around future observers if it happens if it isn't funded if it doesn't get off the ground i think we'll use the basis of a lot of, of that research to try and find other ways of doing it but uh, so uh, this is quite roundabout to your question and that would then involve the designers in becoming a place where research specific research is commissioned and takes place i would say though that you know curatorial teams uh, i want to sort of pay homage to the curatorial team that I've inherited at the Design Museum. They're very agile, they're very unegotistical, they're very open and keen and happy to work on a whole range of projects. In some ways, there's a parallel with the team I had at the Royal Academy. Uh, Many museum curators, uh, some of whom are my best friends, have a deep and admirable expertise in certain areas, which I love and admire, but they're often, the institutions become quite siloed and they're only in that area. We have to, because of the nature of what we do, uh, have a team that, that work across the disciplines that also then makes them very good at identifying and facilitating research because we need to find the most important information and the most up-to-date information in order to explore whether a project whether it's an exhibition or a display or a talk or a conference whether that's worth doing and how to do it so i hope we've already got that skill set of networking and and um uh, being able to access good research but we need to generate more of it for sure Okay. Um, inevitably, when you have a kind of RCA in, in session um, uh, a conversation like this, lots of our community are suggesting ideas for the museum. Um, this is a great one from uh, Mulsari Jane, uh, who says, how about, for example, a showcase of the best in case of companies or organizations that are really innovating around sustainability and inclusion in operating for a more just world? For example, L'Oreal apparently redesigned their operations for greater efficiency and profit while achieving their sustainability targets. Couldn't the Design Museum lead in showcasing that kind of redesign process? Um, so, you know, what we're saying here is, 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 is corporate remodeling and, <laughs> and uh, um, uh, is that, a, is that a, I mean, there's a huge design thinking element to that. Uh, is that a good subject for a, uh, cultural yeah. institution. Yeah. Uh, it, it is. Um, I think we have to be careful of taking at face value what um, corporations tell us. Uh, mm-hmm. I think you can imagine the the hostage to fortune that I would undergo if the design was in public published its kind of register of good practice and by implication bad practice. Um, but I think, uh, and also um, I think that our relationship to uh, multinationals, to corporations, to potential corporate sponsors, to actual corporate sponsors is an interesting one and that we have to exist in the real world in that regard. But at the same time, it is interesting the, the, the vulnerability that you have as an institution if you become too close 
to, to, to certain organisations who then, for their own economic reasons, have to pull their support. So we, we certainly are looking for a, a mixed model. Uh, you can see I'm avoiding your question about whether yeah. we want to specifically <laughs> do that. Um, yeah, it's certainly a subject. Let's start with a conference on that, and uh, our questioner can um, can lead and can give a good paper. How um, but, you know, I think how is it different, Tim, from from Ferrari, which is an industrial company? Well, yeah, company or, or, or an, another brands that we're working with. Absolutely, I mean, sure. And I think that I think that if you, you showcase good design and des- and, and design f- and the design strategy historically and, and the present and the future of, of, of various great or landmark companies by definition you're putting them under the spotlight and you're offering your 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 you're shining a critical lens on them so in a sense it's, it's kind of what we do but i think it's i think it is interesting actually and i think that the research that we're looking to do and the future of everything will have to look if we're looking at sustainability and we're looking at by definition we'll be looking at how those those companies operate but i think that's um yeah but, but i'll take, put a bit more meat on that and then send it in and we'll see if that can be the basis of a, of a paper and then we'll see where that takes us that's a good offer switching focus um the question from melanie smith how do you see the design venture program potentially being expanded to follow through student ideas for longer term impact on the student and their own trajectory. That's yeah, no, that's. It's, I mean, I think we need to make sure that we don't um, that we don't that we keep focusing on on the, the the thing that we've developed, which I think is really impressive, and you know, I, I'm, I can take no credit for it, so I can you know tell you what I think, which I think is wonderful. But I think that following on from that, I mean. That, that there's organizations like inter university that we should get closer to or try and help because you know i would hope that the that the the successful students and you know success with design venture isn't just the winning i mean taking part matters and 10 10 student 10 schools got commended last year but i would hope that some of those students go on to study design in different ways at undergraduate and postgraduate level and so the whole journey from 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 our family learning to, to school age to design venture to undergraduate to postgraduate we you know we run a postgraduate course with Kingston we need to be looking more at that and and likewise for um, designers in residence but I, I want some uh, some some more residences and I, and that may include small scale companies or startups if that's possible in in the in the museum um, but I think it's also something that it would be great to try and roll out more nationally and work with other partner organisations as far as design venture is concerned. But of course, people like the idea of coming to and having it showcased in the National Design Museum. So, um, but that's where the digital may come into play too. So yeah, I think we, we, looking at what else we can do and how we can build on that, I think is, is, very, um, is a very good idea. Well, I think with the students of tomorrow, I think that's quite a good place to uh, yeah. end our conversation because our hour is nearly up. There are some wonderful comments and wonderful questions. I'm sorry we can't get to all of them. Um, there's an interesting, I'm not going to ask you to answer this, Tim, uh, but uh, Amrita Kulkarni has said, who decides the difference between good design and ineffective design? What platforms are raising this question and facilitating an answer? And, and that's, But I, let me tell you, one of the shows I want to do is yeah. about failure, but I, I have to frame it really carefully, but how you learn from things that don't work okay. Yeah. And it's not just it is so it's about taste, functionality, opportunity, but there it's a really interesting area, actually, good and bad design, failure, yeah. And Colette Wilson has said museums are in a good position to look back, and it surely takes a good amount of time to pass before we can have a better perspective on what happened. Which I think is an interesting uh our second poll question was about the role of museums, and I think I think that's quite a good kind of good uh, uh counterpoint to Amrita's comment. Um mm. Our time is up. We could, uh, we know uh, that we could have had a three-hour conversation uh, on just some of these topics. I hope people have found it of interest. Tim, I want to say a huge thank you on behalf of the RCA community for sharing your thoughts with us um, and your expertise. We're all excited about getting back into the Design Museum next week and and seeing Kraftwerk and the Chemical Brothers. And uh, I'm going to be one of those people. Um, thank you all for coming. Thank you to Tim Marlowe. Um, and do stay in touch with us for the next in session. Thank you. Bye bye. Thank you. It's a pleasure. Keep those ideas coming.
Uh, thank you both, uh, Jeremy and Tim, uh, for sharing your thoughts and expertise. And thank you to everyone who joined us for today's in-session talk. If you have any additional questions or would like to connect directly with the executive education teams and the speakers, please use the contact information on this slide. Um, I encourage you to uh, follow us on social media at RCS World Courses on Twitter and Instagram. And make sure to check our event webpage for upcoming in-session talks and how to register for free. And um, the URL is on the slide. Thank you for your time and goodbye, everybody. <laughs>